Bill, a year ago, I had the pleasure of addressing the Roscoe de Schwab meeting. And um, it so happens then that tonight is a like a strange combination between an evening of Zecher Tzadik Libracha on the one hand and the joyful event of Shirat to renew our lives, the Avat Torah of Yerat Shemayim. If you look a bit deeper, I think there is a very good connection between the two. At times, Zecher Tzadik Libracha, particularly in our tomb, you and I and all of us are not feasible. Actually, present explain what I'm referring to. At least we were not feasible from the point of view of our religious outlook. Sometimes corn has gone to seeds in order that new life should spring forth. And that's exactly the combination. Tonight, the 99th yacht site. Agaon, Rabbi Shamsha ben Lofal Hirsch, Zecher Tzadik Libracha. The month of Mazal Deli, when we try, Li means we are trying to draw the water. It was him and no one else to whom we owe that spiritually, what one usually called modern orthodoxy, is existing. It is not my task to explain this in, de in detail. However, I cannot help but make one or two remarks. The one is, whenever there is an epoch-making genius, a great personality, then that personality is one of many facets. And so also in regard to Abisham Shambin of the Honor Ibracha. There were facets which may seem to you, to many others, that they are time-linked. The question of succession, and there may other point, maybe other points. But whenever a great personality appears on the firmament, then it is a person who, like a searchlight, can only be appreciated later on sometimes hundred years later when you see that the food will spring forth. So when I said before, authentic Judaism is not feasible had it not been for the Shamshon for this is what I mean. His thesis of Torah in Derech Eretz, frequently misunderstood, is a thesis of formula for life. Actually, all the Dole Israel have always applied Torah in their hands, which means to apply the immutable principles, the eternal values of Torah to all circumstances and all conditions at all times. However, the situation in the 19th century in Western Europe one was one of going down road. And the savior of the pioneer, the savior of religious Judaism, and the most prominent exponent of bringing it to the Jewish masses again and rescuing them was the Shashma Kualiyash. I may make a small personal remark. I was born in a town near Frankfurt where this great influence has been felt. And one of his officers was the Rav, Rabbi Michael Kahn who was very often the one, was a firebrand, who did what his great mentor told him to do. And it was felt. It was felt in a little town amongst the so-called Landsjuden, who had not yet come to the big cities, that in their homes, Jewish, the light of Jewish religious observance had been kept strictly, the Tarat Tarat the Russian, therefore, were all kept strictly 
and it was a wonderful cohesion of Jewish communal organization. All this due to this great genius whom we only begin now to appreciate what he did. We are very fortunate tonight to have two worthy speakers. First of all, his great grandson, my dear friend, Mr. Cesar, Mr. Jakob Breuer, who will tell us about his life. I just permitted myself to ask him before. I was wondering why his father changed his name, which was originally Frankfurter, to Hirsch. I don't know, maybe you can help me, but this is a fact which I could never, um, which could never stop. Or the grandfathers changed it. Um, but anyway, he was a real Frankfurter after all. Um, now, and I say no modern orthodoxy, which is so badly needed in Israel today, is feasible without the great legacy of Rav Shamsha of Korea. The day school movement, Jewish day school, which I have also a small share, is inconceivable without Rav Shamsha of Korea. He was, who was the first one who founded that great Jewish student in school in Frankfurt, or from there, it spread everywhere, and thirdly, it is the Jewish people who live in Israel. Never mind, when I tell you that. Without the Shamsha for the Yeshiva Tichonit, would never have been, would never have saved Jewish youth today in Israel. Now, when I said Rabbi Breuer will teach you what it's like, I also have the great pleasure of speaking to you, sir, to ask you, Adorn, Rabbi Horvitz, to speak on the influence, the impact of the Council of Christ's life in his work to all of you, to the modern world. May I mention that it was Rabbi Horvitz, who, if I am not mistaken, helped by Grunfeld to translate, or he was the one who translated himself, the greater part of uh, the Horeb of Rabbi Samson of the years. But I know for sure that there are many uh, writings which have not been the light yet, which will, um, I think, under his guidance, or with his help, or to light. I would like to mention one thing which I just looked up tonight. When we talk of modern authorship, he is very often being mistaken also for that kind of historic approach of the literature of the student homes. I think tonight in the series that I don't know whether I translate it properly, said in Kufu Test in the Telem, in the first process, I translated it the following way. Faithfulness, faithfulness in the observance of mitzvahs is not and it's it's not a mere speculation. It's not done by mere speculation about them. The speculative speculation becomes important in its given period. In other words, just profound insight in Judaism was in the fact that he is just restated in modern terms, in contemporary terms, the eternal vendors of his sky. The the Avatum Avatora Virachumayim in the language of our day. That's what it is. Tachli Koch Mokhayim was always to work on Martin Solim. I hope that Rabbi Horvitz will dwell on this aspect of Rabbi Horvitz's philosophy, maybe on the speculative etymology of Rabbi Horvitz, who was able to discover the intellectual concept conception of every word in which he explained, maybe also the symbolism of Mitzvah, Tanya, Mitzvah, or yes, I may I add a final remark. I hope, I speak now for myself, that the 99th Yotai will be a forerunner for a great appreciation of these pioneering on effort making work of Justin for years. Our two worthy speakers tonight will give you I would give you a flashback uh, on, uh, on what it ought to be done. All I feel, what I hope for, that we shall have in Irakodesh, in Yerushalayim, in the coming year, at least some kind of Rabbayer Center, I would like to call it Yatora Hirsch, which is badly needed to the Jewish people. May these lectures tonight be helping us that the coming year will be 
able that we shall be able to see in our new campus the building, the establishment of a Yato Rafiosh. Rabbi Boy of the Bakasha.
They must be changed in a way that they fit into the framework of those. And this is what we call a legitimate revolutionary. And this happened uh, all along through history, but in modern terms, and modern doesn't just mean the last uh, 50 years, it actually began with the French Revolution. As we know, the French Revolution opened not only the ghetto, or the ghetti, but it also changed profoundly the attitude towards the many of the concepts which today seem to be understood. There were incredibly new circumstances in the areas of individual law, the area of humanism, of liberty. We think of the individual not as a gift, but as a challenge. We think of humanity not as a goal, but as a stepping stone to about such a Capitalism, if it's the chief motive of life, is pure about the all. And science, meaning to advance the, the domination of man over, over, over life, over his environment, is certainly not the final source of truth. Now all this new, these new circumstances flooded the human culture, especially of the way. And we all know the result, the far-reaching result of this young 19th century. There are two words that come to mind when you talk about this. One is the cry for <coughs> emancipation, which is the dominating theme in the Irish education of the 19th century. And as a result of this, emancipation means equality, egalitarian, as Napoleon would have called it. The total, the, um, the total, I would say, being alike with everybody else. But out of this, of course, logically, the next uh, movement was assimilation. Not only having the same rights, but also being as all the others are. All these are things which are, of course, no illusion at all, just a logical historical development. Now, this, of course, we know affected, we'll talk about this in just a moment, the West primarily. But of course, the, the uh, side effects also drifted towards the East. The East meaning this vast reservoir of Jewish life, Jewish thought, Jewish learning, Jewish thinking, which we call the Austin. Now, what was the reaction of the East, of those centers, those strong, centers of, of, of the Jewish life. Not only the shtetl, but symbolized by the shtetl, by the, by the total, I would say, uh, self-imposing isolation. Uh, and here we come with a word like manifestation. The, result, the response of the East, the response of the leadership of the Rabonim, of the Rabonim of the East, was universally the same. Now, not the ideological circumstances, but the physical ones had to be maintained at all costs. In other words, the, the way of life, the dress, the way of, of, of living, of housing, and so forth, had to be preserved in order to, to save the way of power living. And the result was that these circumstances. I would say these outer trappings of Jewish life became identified with Torah itself, or rather with the fulfillment of Torah, with Kima I don't know whether I make myself clear. In other words, to give a practical example, it became important to them in order to, 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 to build a, a bulwark against this flood, this threatening flood from the West, to intensify the physical way of life by shutting out the outer world and remaining on the same, I'm talking again, only on the physical way of living. Just to make it more clear is the spinal, the kapotas, the kaftan, and so forth, which were identified uh, with 
at that time with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the Torah, the Torah life. And I don't have to say to you that this actually continues until our very day. And it should not be a critic of, uh, by someone who's not uh, used to uh, Schreiber or to a or to the that some of these trappings were actually historically imported from the non-Jewish world and were adopted then by the Jews at that time who then maintained that while these trappings were long already gone in the non-Jewish world. And there are many other such instances. Now that was in the East. Of course we all know that unfortunately through the political uh, pressure uh, and I'm talking now in the middle of the, of the 19th century, I'm not talking about the, the end of the 19th century, the Russian pogroms and the American immigration then. The result, of course, was that many um, individuals who were perhaps not as firmly rooted in this lifestyle of our living, but who were protected and, and maintained by, its, by their surroundings, were attracted by this, and many of them took the trip towards the West. And to them it happened what happened, of course, on a much larger scale in the West, in a much faster way to, 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 to this stream, which was not a great big stream, but it was, especially towards Germany, towards uh, Berlin, and, and places towards the East. Uh, it is like jumping into a pool without being prepared for it. This, this, these people were much faster in their assimilation, in their total absorption in, in, a, in, a, in a foreign world, than, than people who went where, where this process also took place, but at a much smaller scale. Now, when we talk about the, um, the West, as you heard before, Rav Hirsch was not the first one to, to introduce the concept. I wouldn't even talk about the term the at this point but to um, bring the outer world closer to the Jewish world. We all know that Moses Mendelssohn was the first one who really, by his translation of the, of the Homish and uh, other works, who brought, who tried to bring the world of uh, the German world into Jewish life. The only trouble was that he hoped that Tao would somehow be able to be assimilated to, the, to, to, to this way of life. And we know, I think I can take for granted, that we know we don't discuss him today, uh, the tragic consequence of this, of this approach. And um, it was really left to Hirsch, as you heard before, he took this historic leap into the new land to help the old, unchanged power rule over the new circumstances. The fact that he was born in uh, Hamburg in uh, 180 years ago, 1808, is not as insignificant. Why? Because he uh, uh, had the luck, or, 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 or he was unlucky, in living in a uh, town or being raised in a town which was a center of reform. Hamburg was one of the early centers of reform. And we know that reform was naturally a result of again, of this development in the French Revolution. Reform, as we take this word, is literally means to reform uh, tower as long as it doesn't fit to your way of life. And it didn't, in many ways. I'm not talking about the, 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 the difficulties of, of, of Kima Mitzvot, difficulties in the strictly observing sense, uh, but uh, altogether, now the only solution was for many people to reform the Torah, to make it more acceptable, to make it palatable, to make it more modern. Or to use a word that Hirsch used very often, to make Torah up to date. And in a nutshell, I really want to give you a, 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 a sort of a slogan before even going to his life. This is actually what Hirsch did, to bring the life of today and not the Tao. The Tao does not have to be brought up to date. Hirsch was born in, in, in Hamburg and uh, 
he learned under Hacham Bernay, who was a perhaps the first one who spoke, his, who delivered his German, his sermon in German, <coughs> and who was who had a great influence on his future development. When he uh, was a very young man, he his father originally didn't want him to uh, go into the into learning, into the homes, wanting to become a Jewish man. But I think it was the influence of what he saw around him, the, uh, as I told you, the, the, this growing reform movement, the first synagogue that had an organ, and so on, which determined him to, to change his whole life. He went to Mannheim, with the great Rabbi Yaakov Eklinger, the old Lanier, and there he was for a certain amount of time, after that, he did something which was also unusual for this age. That means 140 50 years ago. He studied at the University of Bonn. At a very young age, he was uh, only um, 22, he received a call as a chief rabbi of Oldenburg. That was in 1830. <laughs> In Oldenburg, Oldenburg actually was, uh, we know of Rabnos and Adler, who became chief rabbi of, of England, of, of uh, London, or England perhaps. And there he, uh, the outstanding fact of his stay in Oldenburg, which was not a very successful stay, nor was his next um, call to end all in the northern, northeastern part of Germany, because people were really not ready for him or as it happened in Emden, when he was asked after five years why he left, he said, because this is the first shower that ever has come to him in five years. <laughs> <laughs> and this signifies what happened. In uh, Oldenburg became outstanding for two reasons, for two uh, facts. One is both literary facts. One is the 19 letters, which I see here on the desk. The 19 letters, which I'm sure you're familiar with this passion of this word, were actually not his first intended work. His first work was Horeb, the famous Horeb. But he felt Horeb was a, 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 I would say, an analysis of Torah per se, which he divided into six parts. In order to, however, prepare his audience, his vast unknown audience, uh, for, for that, he invented, which was the style of the time, he invented an imaginary correspondence, a meeting between a Ra and a young student who uh, was, as we today see so often, who was totally uninformed uh, of anything Jewish, but who had an urge to find, find, a, find himself. And uh, this was done in four letters. And uh, if you read the first letter of the 90 letters, it's very dangerous, because if you read it, Hirsch was not uh, only um, a leader, he was also a very gifted writer. If he hadn't been what he was, he might have become one of the uh, famous classical writers of the 19th century in Germany. In German, too. But the first letter, is called complaints. This young man complains to this Raf who he met. And this complaint, this letter, these few pages are so convincing. It is complained against the against this Torah life, the, the difficulties which I mentioned before, the unpleasantness, this constant uh, uh, how would I say the the, the word tiktok. Tiktok means not only grammar but this 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 uh, fine observance of every tiny inch of law, all this bothers him. The difficulties of dealing with the non-Jews in travel, in business, in restaurants, and so forth. <coughs> why? What for? And so on. When you start after the first letter, that's why I meant the stage, because you might, it might affect you. Uh, but then follows immediately the next 18 letters. And uh, they, 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 they made an enormous impact. Today you would call it a bestseller. I'm not sure in terms of how many volumes were published or printed, but it made an enormous impact on it, especially on the on the on, on the youth in, in Germany. And then two years later followed the Howard, 
which is addressed to the thinking uh, young man and woman. The Chorv is divided into six parts, into Torahs, Shvotim, I mean, we cannot discuss it at this point, uh, each detail, as little as we can discuss, for instance, the, the, the letters itself, uh, these 90 letters. Uh, each one is devoted to a certain uh, topic. This Chorv is divided into six parts, Torahs, Shvotim, Chukim, Mitzvahs, Edos, and Avonah. And uh, there's a very, uh, very important and significant and profound introduction to the Chorev. And I might, since I mentioned the word introduction, I might tell you that uh, you mentioned Dr. Wundfeld before the Mount War, the Dyer's Mountain, the late Lamenta Dyer, uh, who was, in my own opinion, uh, perhaps the most, uh, the foremost translator of Rafiash into, into English and uh, who opened him the really to the Western world. And he himself wrote, in, 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 he translated the Chorev. But he wrote introduction to the Chorev, which is almost as long as the Chorev itself, which is worth reading. This is perhaps the best expose of, of Hirsch that has been written since, since uh, it's a boy uh, Coming back to, uh, to um, Oldenburg and Emden, then came a call to, um, these were relatively insignificant positions that he had, relatively. But then came a call to a city which was in the end of Israel, called Nikolsburg, in Moravia, which is today Czechoslovakia. Nikolsburg was a, was a dangerous ground because it was full of uh, enormous uh, alongus, Mandigi Israel, uh, going back many, many years. But it also had become a center for a movement which we know as the Maskilian, which again was an indirect uh, result of the, of the revolution many years before. And into this city, which was actually a, a tense situation, Hirsch was, was placed. And he was welcomed with great fanfare by both parties, because the Maskilian hoped that this man who had sort of we agreed that a fresh, a fresh break into, into the Western world uh, would sort of be a support for their uh, goals. And of course, the others, the tradition, uh, today would say conservative, but only in quote, would, uh, were, were looking for this. I mention this only because of what happened at the end, after, after, after his stay in, in, in Nicholsburg. It was a very successful stay in the sense that he uh, built a, a, a very large yeshiva, yeshiva Gavara, that he uh, was elected to the parliament, which uh, was politically active on behalf of Jewish causes. Um, it was a great tradition. It was a famous uh, <coughs> But perhaps this situation that I mentioned before was instrumental or helped for him to decide something which seems rather uh, strange. If you today would think of uh, um, uh, someone who is ready to become chief rabbi, let's say, of Tel Aviv, and um, someone with some little issue somewhere in the south uh, needs a rabbinical leader and would ask to come and would come there, it would be in Congress. Or if someone in, 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 in a small little town in Midwest uh, America um, would go, go to a town like this if he could have a position in vast. Uh, community in, in, in New York or, in, or in, in Chicago. I mention this because he had received a call by a community in Frankfurt, in Germany, which Blum have referred to before. Now Frankfurt, of course, I'm sure you all know, is a, uh, is, 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 is a concept in Jewish history. Because Frankfurt was the city of, of the Schlora Kodosh. Hassan Safa was born there. It was an irredeemable world for many, many years. But in very, in, in, in nowhere, I would almost say, or in few places, did the, 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 the French Revolution with its, with its disastrous results uh, create such havoc as in Frankfurt. Within a short time, in history, 40 years is very little. Since from, from 1810 or 15 up to 1850, this new wave managed to destroyed Frankfurt, the Jewish Frankfurt, went to a point, and the reform, especially, 
uh, found a fertile ground. It went so far that there was an active campaign against Jewish life in the form of closing the mikvahs, of forbidding shkites in Frankfurt. Even even Brismilis were fought against. With the result that there was perhaps a handful of people left on their Hayosha. And this handful of people, the minion, one claims it was 11 people, or probably more, but they were a small, tiny group. They turned to this towering personality of the Middle East, to Rafael, with a request to come to Frankfurt and rescue them. And he accepted it. I mean, it's all in a nutshell, it probably didn't go so fast. It was also a matter of 10 children whom we had and whom we had to support and so forth. And this was a very tiny community in Frankfurt. The reason was a very simple one. He knew that the West was endangered. It isn't that he thought that he was the only one to do it, but it turned out, as we heard before, that this is that would happen. Because there was one thing engraved in him, the fight against the reform. Every word that he wrote, and he finds, if you look into his writings, the harshest terms, sometimes incredibly brutal, against reform. To him, there, were no, there was no compromise possible. So he went to Frankfurt, and in Frankfurt he found nothing. He found a minion of, of people who governed in a small, in a, in a, in a small place. Now the situation in Frankfurt, I might like to, to, to prepare for the next step, was as follows. There were many Jews there. There was a large congregation. There were he lost in his place. Now this congregation was a reform congregation. And uh, these few people were outside of it. But there was a law that you had to be a member. There was only one congregation possible in the town. That's all. Here was a congregation, but there was a reform congregation. And the German government did not recognize anything else. So these people created an illegal little place with Raf Hirsch. And Raf Hirsch set about to build his Kehila. But before he did that, he did something else, historically uh, uh, established. And that was to start school. Uh, this is where the, 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 the whole, as you said before, the whole today in the day school, I would say the Torah school uh, movement began, uh, which also, which was unheard of, created a secular department for secular studies. The school was also started on a very small scale, but in a very short time, again, 20 years is not a long time, but 25 years. This was in 1850. By 1870, this uh, school and this Kehillah, which in the meantime had built its own building, but buildings can only use are often are just uh, a shell. But they were part and parcel of it, uh, became a, a, a very well established community. But there was one thing missing. And that one thing is perhaps encapsulating one word, that word was independence. Because of the law that I mentioned to you before, which was prevalent throughout Germany, this community was illegal. Or rather, it was it existed, but it was part and parcel of the general congregation, which was a reform congregation. But this congregation or its leaders realized the danger, in quote, that arose from the right by this growing uh, 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 And in order to uh, deflate that, this reform uh, congregation established its own orthodox uh, sector, I would say. And part and parcel of, the, of, this, of this larger congregation, which was the official one, uh, and to whom you had to pay taxes, by the way, established a sector for religion. to present this as, as what is that. And there were many people, and, and this was uh, uh, its own, its own uh, shul and its own uh, institutions and so forth, and it looked all not, not really too unattractive for many individuals. Don't forget, people are gullible, not only in, in, in business, but also uh, when it comes to this uh, aspect. And the situation is, it became so that there were people who were members of the, or rather part and parcel of the Hirsch community, but were also, of course, in this 
newly established religious part of the reform institution. And the word tension that I mentioned in the beginning became very, very, very uh, noticeable in this case. The Rafirsch began a fight which consumed most of his, of the, of the second to last decade of his life. Actually starting with, uh, started immediately, but began really to become, to become um, serious uh, in, the, in the early 70s. The fight was, for one word, which, which you probably have heard in German, and I'll translate it for you, the word was Austrit. Austrit means secession. Now that sounds like a negative approach. All we want to do is Austrit, meaning to leave. But this was the entire program. The idea was we must be independent. We cannot have any kind of uh, dependence on reform or anything that is dependent on reform. And of course, you will, you will realize without my telling it to you how, how timely this, this, this situation is when you think about present situation. Now, this was a very bitter fight for two reasons. One was to convince the authorities, the going to of, the, of this. To them, this, they didn't know the forces of, of, of internal Jewish, Jewish uh, religious politics. There was a congregation established. What's need, and it had even uh, the institutions that are required by, by religious Jews. So what, what, what do you really want? That was one. Berlin was in charge. The other one was a conflict within the Jewish ranks. Within the Jewish ranks, there was fit of that too. And there were great drowning in Western Europe who did not support the Austrians, who felt that if, 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 if there's total independence within the framework of the larger congregation, uh, that is good enough. And again, you can uh, translate that yourself into the political aspect uh, of our own time. I will mention what is happening to you and leave to you to, uh, to, to compare these two situations. The result is, since this is only an overview, can't really go into it. The result is that it was that after a very unpleasant fight, unpleasant in the sense that it also affected relationships between Rav Hirsch and and uh, the Aonim in, 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 in Western Europe, he did not feel that way. But he prevailed. And in the year 1876, the Austrian law was signed. And this was the beginning, actually, of a very of a new phase in German uh, Jewish Orthodox, Orthodoxy, I would say. Because very quickly, uh, this uh, set an example for many communities in, in Germany. And the, and the term Austrittsgemeinde became a program, became a cry for independence. And the effect is felt even until today. I would say that to talk about this for a moment, to apply this to, 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 to our to us as well here, is very difficult because we do not have any kind of situation of that kind. There are no congregations, as you know. There are no rabbis in that sense, Rabbanim. I mean, Rabbanim now, Tehila, Tehila rabbis. The fact which to anyone who comes here or lives here or immigrates here is, is, uh, is, is, is a strange thing, actually. It's something that bears uh, discussion on its own. Why is that? Why, why don't it have a large community <coughs> of, of its own instead of importing somebody to a certain occasion? In America, the situation is totally different. Every congregation has a rabbi, must have a rabbi, who must speak every chance. You know? And um, yet, there is, no, there is no such thing as Austrian in that sense, because there is no Eintritt, there is nothing, there is no, no coercion by the government. Strict separation, church and state, as you know, which was not in Germany. But there is a political and a spiritual Austrian. And you may remember, and I'd like to, 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 to quote that, that 20 years ago, uh, the famous uh, Takanda of 11 Rabbanim in New York, in America, or Shishina, or Kotler, and so forth and so forth, and so on, made a Xera in the Kanad that there is no um, permission, no should, to participate in any shape, or fashion, or form in any organization or any activity organized by the Reform or the Conservatives, <coughs> which in itself, you can imagine, raised. And it's prevalent until today. And unfortunately, the vast majority, even of orthodoxy, 
uh, while it may simplify, I'm talking about America now, uh, doesn't follow through. Doesn't follow through. There are many, unfortunately, uh, situations where there is a dependence on on uh, anything that is that is not uh, strictly independent orthodoxy and that has its effect on the American scene. Now, <coughs> um, in Frankfurt, uh, it's, it's rather incredible when you read, when you when you study his life in Frankfurt, the last 35 years of his life, when he lived or 38 years he lived in Frankfurt, what one man, and I don't want to exaggerate it, uh, we, we wonder how Rashi in his lifetime it's, uh, could, could, could find the, the, the time, I would say, I'm not talking about his, his genius, for his, for his, for his, for his devotion. Of Hirsch, was totally alone. He created the whole thing. He, he put up a, 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 a massive villa which became a, 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 a model of the lot throughout the world. He created the school in the event in totally alone. There are, uh, there's a whole, um, uh, uh, many files of his, of his, of his, his, of his handwritings, uh, which not only have truths which are not known, but which also give out outlines for, for curriculum, programs, details, teachers, and so on. Something that Ibn Ahel usually does. He's done it all. And at the same time, he wrote in Frankfurt his masterwork, the Perish of the Homish, which, if you glance at it, and, and in Boko Shem, it has become one of the widely read the Hoshim in, the, in, I would say, Western world. Uh, it, it's really, a, on a human basis, I would use the word genius, I assume, because otherwise it wouldn't would be possible. Now this happened in Frankfurt. He wrote, actually, uh, I must say, he wrote incessantly, incessantly. But um, uh, concretely, we can only point to, as I said, to the 19 letters and to the Horev, plus in Frankfurt the Homish, plus the healing. And that's why it ends, as far as uh, safety is concerned. Um, the question why there are no shoes, uh, say for Afirsh, is often the asked, and it's not for this, or for this uh, evening to be discussed, but uh, 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 talking about, uh, um, as, a, as a book, these are the four or five things that we know. There is a vast body of writings, which are not in form of a, of a, of a, of a book, where you can say, this is the healing, this is the homage. By the way, the Siddur that you've seen, I'm sure the Siddur, it wasn't written by him in the sense that he wrote a Siddur. It was after his death, of course, put together. It's his writing, but it's not written by him as a Peirshul Siddur. Or the Haggadah <laughs> has come out last year or two years ago. Um, have you seen the Hirsch Haggadah? Written by, by a cousin of mine, Breuersch, uh, um, who, which is also not written by Hirsch as a Haggadah, but of course it is Hirsch. Since the Haggadah itself is mostly based on 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 on, 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 on. Uh, but um, permit me just to mention to talk about the Khunish for a moment. Uh, it is it uh, Rav Hirsch has often been, I would say, I wouldn't use the word accused, but suspected of lacking in numbers. After all he hasn't uh, published uh for um shoes are available but they are not they are not uh, uh, they are not available actually to the general public. If you read the Chumash, if you really start the Chumash, you 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 realize what a devout Elamim was, and 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 his pikiut is is, is 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 sometimes so incredible if you think of the fact that there was no computer at that time where you press a button and all the answers are in front of you, uh, but you have to really get into the into the into it. It's not enough just to read it down. Now um, the great schus of of uh, Dr. Levy, Dr. Levy is on board in London who was a grandson of Hirsch, is that he brought this homage to the, uh, open to the, this homage to the, to the English-speaking world. Uh, I don't mind telling you, perhaps it's not nice to say, that, um, that, that the English isn't always the easiest to read, I would say. It makes Hirsch, whose German is extremely difficult, not, not always easier. And, um, but, like the Ibn Tibon who translated the Rambam into, into Hebrew from, from Arabic writings and saved him for us. 
this is what would happen. It would be a mitzvah to do, to, to do it again today, perhaps, uh, to be worth it. Um, but it's a great, it's a great feat. And, and, and it opened Hirsch to, and this was actually the beginning of the flood. Uh, I'd like to mention to you, I heard the word etymology before. I don't know how much I take away from our poem. I asked him how long he speak. I said, I, I said 20 minutes. He said, oh, no, no, please, more. He said that to me. I don't know. I don't even, I don't even know how, what time it is. I won't be long. Uh, etymology, you used the word before, which I would object to, actually. You used the word speculative. Remember that? Speculative. Of course, it's true. Speculation. But speculation has the, has the aura of something that is very tenuous and um, something a bit suspect. And that objective, if you really read it unbiased, that you have to do. If one opens Hirsch, uh, and you are already uh, without doubting this approach, then don't start. I, I would like to uh, give you a little anecdote that happened incidentally with Dr. Lee's Van Rover. He did what Hirsch himself did, or rather what was done. Hirsch didn't write the Chumsh, you know, sat down and do it. Hirsch gave Shiurim, and out of the Shiurim, uh, people who wrote it with a uh, long and so forth, his own notes and so on. It, it was. Dr. Levy did the same thing in London. He gave a shiur in Komish. In fact, it was a shemos. Now, shemos here, shiur. And some people wrote it along. He gave it in English. And out of this, it developed. And he wrote it. And at that time, he, uh, he sent the first ten psukhm of shemos in the English translation to my father, that was in New York. Who was the uh, head of the family for his approval as a Kama. Father from Rome, I was there when it happened, it's, it's 30 years, 25 years ago. Took one look at it, and I've seldom seen him so furious. <laughs> for one reason only. For one reason only. But Dr. Levy, for maybe because of that, left out all etymology in the first time so Just up in, in Schmaus, if you look in last week's Pasha, there's lots of it there. He left it out. Uh, I'm sure the carbons were good. He may have felt something like that, or he may have felt he wanted to concentrate on this, to, even though you cannot separate it. Anyway, my father's one who saw that and fired over a telegram to him that if he would persist in doing this, he would not only not give it to Haskell, but make a macho publicly against it. Of course, it was dropped. It's all in there. But, uh, Dr. Levy had a tiny little in quote bench by adding his own comment very often with the initials I, L, other, which is a fine. Anyway, uh, I'd like to give you one little example, which is, which is uh, you can, I can give you hundreds of examples, which uh, Robert Blumenthal chose to call speculation, which I call, uh, call it inspired, or even more than that. Uh, I'll give you one little thing, but there are hundreds and hundreds of such examples. And missing incident in the literature of Hirsch is a, a uh, how do you call this, a, uh, I would say almost a dictionary of these various things, alphabetically uh, organized. Because at the moment it's all over. Cross, you know, cross, uh, um, how do you call this? References. Cross references. This is what you're to do, and it's still waiting for someone to sit down and do it. Uh, I'll give you one example. Hirsch wrote it somewhere in Polish. He used the word Kartan Vagador. Kotan and Godard. These are two total opposites. Yet, Hirsch bases his etymology on a very simple rule that Rashi quotes, namely that the Otiot or Oniot, letters which are pronounced in the same place in your, in your throat or in the mouth or on the outer, the outer lips, are related to each other. Such as the, 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 the T and the D. You see, the T is strong, t, the D is a soft one. S and Z, you understand? Both pronounced in the same place. Now he takes the words go down and go down, which are total opposite. And he simply, if you if you visualize this word in your mind, the word katan on top, kuk tet nam, and under it you have gimel dal glamet, and you draw a line, you will readily see that they are related to each other. This is, couldn't be an accident. Gimel and, you know, the kuf and the dalit and the tet, and even the lamad and the nun, because if you, if you pronounce them, you will see that the tongue and so forth, and that's the same thing. 
and, and, and uh, the speculation comes in by, by the reasoning for it, the ideology behind it. And here's a very simple one. He says that katan gadol are measures of size. And you cannot say this is big or this is small. It depends on the, on, on the, on the person or on the, on the, on the, on the subject who, who, who analyzes or looks at it. To a tiny mouse, it appears a giant. And to a tall person, it's small. That's all. You can only say it looks to me small. <coughs> so very simple, almost childish uh, 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 example. But it gives you in a nutshell what he does on a large, vast scale throughout the country. And to me, at least, this is, this is something that overwhelms me every time I see it. That's exactly uh, I would like to come to an end quickly. Uh, let me say something about our own, own time, which I think, I hope, I always we do. There are three approaches which, which today uh, prevail in the Jewish world. One is the Torah-only approach. Very serious. In other words, Torah-only. No part of any outside activity or learning, which, as you know, is, 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 is widespread. The other one is a reluctant reproachment to the outside, but sort of uh, through the back door. And the third one is Taun Now, Taun Lehrer of Hirsch was not a Hawass show, even though most people would say it was. Hawass show means a decision which was born by the needs of the particular moment. It was much, much, much more than that. It was a basic philosophy of life which applied <coughs> before him and during him and applies for a long time. It was pointed out before, and I mentioned it also. It's as simple as that. Tell der Heers, der Heers, of course, doesn't mean here good manners, although it's a good idea to also have that. But der Heers means way of life. Der way of life. Life itself. If we feel that everything is, 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 is created free of a Bochu, everything, then this is only true. Now, Torah Deres means simply this. Torah is the immutable, as I mentioned before. Ter Eres is the fleeting, the changing. What we must do is we must apply life to Torah and not Torah to life. In a nutshell, all the history. Now, whether this is against what goes on in modern life doesn't interest me whatsoever. But whatever is good in modern life, whatever is good in a university, you, you, you don't. Of course we do. I, I come from a background where uh, we, we, do, we do send the students to, to, to universities. But first, after learning two or three or four years without high school, after high school, so they are not uh, uh, burdened by, by tests and so forth. Our school, for instance, in New York, we have a high school, of course, and the following lesson marriage with Smir at the end. It's called Shamsung from their school, of course. Uh, propagates exactly that. Our, 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 I would say our religious studies, our, our learning studies, our, uh, go as long as possible to 2.30 in the afternoon, from 8.30. And then, of course, we, we do have, we do, uh, and I wouldn't say have to squeeze in, we do uh, have these secular subjects which are required with the, the matric at the very end. But then, we want our issues, our students, to stay at a minimum of two years in only learning. Because it's the only time in their lives, and I'm not talking about the Yechides Gullet, those few, or hopefully not so few, whose abilities and whose, whose leadership qualities uh, seem to point the way to, 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 to Jewish leadership, in you know, the bonus or other ways. And there, of course, sit to learn all your life. You cannot afford to do anything else. But the average person, and I might also use the word Kohler here. It's a wonderful development, perhaps one of the uh, of, of terrible tragedies that we have as uh, people, that the, 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 this, this stress on, 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 the, on this only learning, sitting learning. It's an inspiring thing. And yet, you know that the biggest call in the world today, I think numerically, is in, is in Lakewood. Numerically. Close to a thousand people. And Lakewood was found to have cottage of Hamburg. And I've been there personally and saw it. Akota was the one who would, when he noticed somebody who sat there four or five years and learned only, and his growing family came and so forth. And he saw that this was not the man 
who would be able to 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 play a role in, in Jewish leadership. He would tap on the shoulder and said, "It's time for 47th Street, which is the dining club." <laughs> <laughs> he was not a man living uh, up someplace. He knew, and he had the courage to do this. And I would publicly say that, unfortunately, our Shishim today, present company is Jewish. Our Shishim today, by, by and large, uh, they may feel safely, but they wouldn't dare. And of course, it's difficult to say that in public because it's a marvelous thing to have a man devote his life to 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 Torah. But whether this is what we are expected to do for the for 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 Klaus or Bechlade, that's the big question. You see. So uh, let me close with a little the time to what Torah. The Gemara says in Shabbos a strange thing. Ilu kind of in the day Shabbos. Famous word, Shei Shabbos house. If his word would keep two Shabbos, we have Nigalo. We could quasi force Akhojibokhu's hand by sending him to Shia. It would be immediately the Ulu Kap. So the question is why two? Why two? Two Shabbos. Why not one? It would be so simple to organize, after all, Shabbos in, in, the, in the, I would say, in the very narrow sense, is Shef Al Tasim. Don't go with a bus to the hospital. Don't <laughs> make a phone call and, and, and buy some free chairs. You understand? Much of it is, don't. Don't do anything. Sit at home. Don't have to dab. Just sit and don't do any little troubles. You could force. I mean, this is, of course, not to be taken seriously. So why two shabbos? So in the Hirschen sense, the answer is follows. It says in, in, in Emmau, at Tzviyot Haoma, Sheva shabos of the bimas, Sheva shabatot the bimas, the yellow. Count seven weeks. And use the word Shabbos there, not sure what. In other words, the word Shabbos can also be translated in certain circumstances as week. The idea is a simple thing. To organize one Shabbos, as I told you before, that might be possible. But to live the week that follows that Shabbos in the spirit of that Shabbos, not to stand in shul on Shabbos like this, and on Sunday or Monday morning you go out and you cheat people's pants off. That is totally the other. To plant Torah into life, but Torah is the glasses through which we judge everything. Whatever is acceptable, we, we absorb. That is why we do send boys to yeshiva, to this university, after have a thorough training from age one, more or less, and then knowing Ma Masha Toshla because I'm not even to talk to him. That is the, the condition, of course, but not to close your eyes to it. So I would like to end by saying to you that almost 100 years after the passing of this great man, Rabbeinu Shamshukol Hirsch, he still speaks to us with a, with a, I would say, with a, an undiminished time, time, timelessness. And I would like to hope that his impact and the impact and the influence of his spirit, of his work, should continue to inspire our generation, future generations. Spusa Yovan Polenko. I think uh, I was right when I told you you would be privileged tonight to hear two most worthy speakers to the light on the impact of Rabshamshuk and Rafael Hirsch. I forgot to tell you, or now it's perhaps, that Rabbi Breuer himself is a great grandson of Rabbi Hirsch. Another addendum which I think ought to be made. Uh, when Rabbi Breuer talked about the school of thought of Torah only, I'm reminded how over 55 years ago I was speaking to the saintly rabbi of Tels about the swore of Rabbi Hirsch and Enish Boinala Karkaot. A swara which he says in Chumish and a bloch sechazadik with Kadosh de Brahas told me, well, aren't you surprised? He's one of the great Goanim. This is what's answer. And no wonder on this was not unfortunately mentioned. His brother-in-law, Rabbi Isaac Yoshovit of Birbalen, wrote to my mind the only translation to the present day of Hirsch Horev. And now, friends, our second, numerically speaking, speaker tonight, most 
worthy speaker because he is a great grandson of the Jakob Ettinger. And I must, must add that Jakob Ettinger, his modest ways, despite his great learning, which need not be talked about in tonight, had a tremendous influence upon the education of Rabbi Hirsch. Therefore, I have very much pleasure in calling upon Rabbi Hirsch. I wish to thank Rabbi Dr. Blumenthal for his words of introduction. I wish to thank also Rabbi Dr. Breuer for his marvelous insights into the life and work of Rabbi Hirsch. I wish to express our appreciation to Mr. Phil Cheschalski for allowing us to participate in the Rosh Chodesh Club, which actually began in the Vayu Shalayim on a small scale through the initiative of uh, Mr. Lobchinsky and Lahavdir bin Chaim Bechbechaim, his late wife, Mrs. Lobchinsky, who was a great admirer and constantly inspired by the writings of Rabbi Hirsch. And uh, we think that uh, this evening is indeed a tribute to her memory, Mr. Lobchinsky. And this course should bring you a Nechama Shalema. Rosh Chodesh is described by Rabbi Hirsch in his incisive comment on next week's parsha, as being the first mitzvah addressed to the people of Israel and expressing the concept of renewal. Our sages put the whole idea in brevity in the explanation of Achodesh Adel Lachem by Dugma Shelachem. This renewal of the moon gives you your model which is Lechaper al Tumat Mikdash for Kodashah, that's the Seer Rosh Chodesh, to work against all our estrangement from all holiness and holy ideas into which we have unconsciously drifted and which we ourselves would not notice. Without this regularly bring ourselves back into communion with our God, without this regular monthly being radiated afresh by the light and warmth of His Spirit, we should always slide further and further from Him quite unconsciously and without our noticing it. So that is why there comes the uh, kapara, the reminder of the moon, which proclaims salvation from sin and evil, which proclaims the just as the moon reflects the light of the sun to the earth. So the people of Israel has to constantly renew itself, even if it's in situations of darkness, such as in Egypt, and thereby return to its full mission of reflecting the glory of Hashem through the Torah to the rest of the world. And uh, Rav Hirsch goes further in explaining that on the basis of Rosh Chodesh, we conduct our whole year and all the festivals, which are called Moed, meeting times, between Hashem and the people of Israel. And as he says in one of his essays, that the catechism of the Jew is his calendar. And it's this concept of constant renewal, which we can take as our theme for understanding the impact of the writings and the work of Rabbi Hirsch for the revival of Judaism in a number of generations, and especially today. The first aspect of anyone coming into contact with his writings is the inspiration. His words are full of deep thought and have an approach of emotion and of, of sincerity and of understanding and are constantly inspired by an arousing of the moral conscience of the individual. We can understand the enthusiastic response which the 19 letters and the other writings of Rabbi Hirsch, as well as his words, made upon the confused traditional Jews of his time. 
But we also know that they made an enormous impact upon the young Gretzky, <coughs> upon Geiger, upon people who were associated with the reform. And on a personal note, I know that uh, my maternal grandfather, Louis Weiss, he lived through the Frankfurt, which is being affected by the reform community. But when he first came into con to contact with the writings, and also with Rabbi Hirsch, and the son of Rabbi Hirsch, and then was educated by that community and by those leaders, until ultimately became the president of the Religionsgesellschaft. So this was the type of effect he had not only upon Frankfurt Jewry, but upon many sections of German Jewry. And here perhaps I'll just say a few personal wor words concerning the uh, various developments of the Frankfurt community that we referred to by Rabbi Dr. Breuer. My grandfather on the other side, he was the one who undertook the domain of orthodoxy. He took over the position in the Werneplatz, that is, in that same section of the Drosgemeinde, which was ready to give in to all the conditions of orthodoxy. And in the uh, responsa, which is available here, Matelevi, which we republished, where he describes the reasons impelling him to accept this position in Frankfurt at the time when Rabbi Hirsch was battling for Ostrit and was very much opposed to this congregation which he was going to head, he said, and that was his attitude, he said, Otto that Saint Rabbi Hirsch, he knows the enormous amount of work that he has done and will continue to do, but he feels there's also something to do in the wider community. And he never allowed any negative word to be mentioned concerning Rabbi Hirsch or the Religionsgesellschaft, his community. And I have been reared in that tradition. Uh, our family is also connected with the Breuer side in a number of ways. And my father, Mother Sholem, was one who uh, strongly believed in uh, trying to see the truth on both sides. And some of my brothers went to the Kishri al Shula. I was the one who still managed to spend three months in the Philanthropin, which was the first fortress of the reform community in Frankfurt. <laughs> and about the situation in the Frankfurt community, which is known in the Rödelheim Siddur, where it often refers to Einig and Gemeinden, which always excludes Frankfurt because it was never Einig, it was never united. I think the important comment we have to remember that there are different approaches and that there's often a lot of truth in both approaches. And maybe the sad comment of Hashgoch of Divine Providence has been provided by the British bomb which fell upon the Frankfurt Cemetery. But fortunately it did not damage any gravestone whatsoever but broke the wall which divided the section of the Hirsch community from that of the Grosskommander. <laughs> now, my, in, my father, Lava Sholem, told me himself, he was a later generation already, that when he was a young man, he gained enormous inspiration from the 19 letters. And although Gothic script was very difficult for me, but I studied it specially in order to be able to read those 19 letters, which had an enormous effect upon me. At that time, I wasn't aware of it, that there was already an English translation. I was a boy of 16, 17, and I, be, I, I have still today my own translation of it. And that also led me to Diane Grunfeld, with whom I collaborated over many years in the translation and editing of the works of Rabbi Hirsch. And whilst I was a student at the Yeshiva, much to the surprise of many of my Chaverim, I used to regularly, together with uh, other commentaries on Pasha Tashavua, used to study diligently the commentary of Rabbi Hirsch and try to give over some of those ideas to the others in the Yeshiva. And so I know that there are many like me, myself. I know that my colleague Rabbi Carmel was also very much inspired by the writings of Rabbi Hirsch that then led him on to Rabbi Zesler. 
and also his writings led me on to take up the study of Torah far more deeply. And there has already been mention made of the enormous impact that Rabbi Hirsch's example and teaching had upon the school movement, education movement, not only that, it's perhaps not sufficiently known that the Beis Yaakov movement, which was founded by Sarah Shanira, was primarily through the inspiration she received from the writings of Rabbi Hirsch, and it began by her starting a chug, a circle, to study his writings in Krakow, and from that developed the whole Beis Yaakov movement. Also, the Torah or Masora movement in the United States, which is the largest day school movement in the world, so much so that recently the chairman of the Torah Masora movement told me that when he came here to Yitzhak Labon, asked to see him a few times in order to find out how are they so successful there with education. <laughs> and it's known that it was founded by Rashradu Mendelovich, who was inspired by the writings of Rabbi Hirsch, and he combined these teachings of Rabbi Hirsch together with his knowledge of Muslim Hasidot in order to found the Shiva Torah Vadas and then to develop his other educational projects. And I would say that this is primarily because of the inspirational aspect which is contained in nearly all the writings that he produced. Now the second point, that Rabbi Hirsch was one who strove to solve the problem of the confrontation of Torah with culture. And in this, there have been three approaches which have all gone in the wrong direction. The first is to capitulate Torah in front of culture. That's assimilation. That has gone on all the time, and unfortunately, this is the most effectual result which we find amongst Jewry today that the vast majority have no Torah left and are entirely affected by alien culture. The other, second approach, is to say that one escapes entirely from every form of association with culture. This has been possible in certain situations. There have been, and still today are, communities where such an approach is effective and where the uh, Torah reigns supreme and drives out all other elements of culture and any connection with any influence that comes from outside. But it's very difficult. And in the modern world, this has often collapsed. And this is what happened at the time of the French Revolution. This is what's happening constantly in our time with different groups that come from closed societies and then they come into the open society. The third approach is that which was adopted by uh, Moses Mendelssohn, which was to say that we will accept Torah to guide our practical lives, and together with that, we will also accept German culture. And we've already heard before what was the result, that his sons, his disciples, ultimately ended up in Christianity. And Rabbi Hirsch in the 19 letters describes the approach of Mendelssohn, which was that to be an observant and traditional Jew, and at the same time to be called the German Plato. This is an approach which he criticizes strongly. It's so in the introduction of Dr. Yitzhak Heinemann to the 19 letters, he says he doesn't really see so much distinction between this approach and the approach of Torah im derav eres, which is also to accept Torah and also to accept culture, a synthesis, to be a Jew in one direction and to be a man of the world in other directions, also a synthesis. But uh, the difference, as we'll soon see, is enormous. Because uh, the approach adopted by Mendelssohn was to engage
engage in a split between the personality that is attached to Judaism, the personality that is attached to the culture, to the science. Now there are also many people today who adopt this approach of synthesis. And you think that is their interpretation of Torah and Derev Eretz. They say, right, that's what Torah and Derev Eretz means. We will accept Torah in a certain compartment of our lives, in another compartment of our lives, we'll be scientists, we'll be philosophers, we'll be men of literature, and in observance, we'll be observant Jews. But this is not correct according to Torah, if one enters into Torah more deeply. Because Torah is an approach to life which is total, which is based upon the service of God and of God alone, and not accepting any other gods, and therefore only accepting God's teaching. And therefore everything in life has to be guided by the Torah. So this was the approach that was adopted by the Rambam, who, although he knew a great deal of science and philosophy of his day, he regarded them all as being handmaidens to the Torah. And this is apparently also the approach adopted by Rabbi Hirsch. But Rabbi Hirsch had strong criticisms of the Rambam because he felt that in his murder of Uchem, the Rambam was making concessions to Greek philosophy and accepting them on their own merits and allowing concepts from Greek philosophy and Arabic uh, culture to use them in order to interpret principles of Torah, whilst it should really be the reverse. Uh, my own opinion is that his criticism of the Rambam is not uh, valid. Because the Rambam makes it is, is different to Maimonides. There are a number of contradictions in what the Rambam says and what, in, in the Mishnah Torah and what he says in the Guide for the Perplexed. When one deals with people who are perplexed and who cannot escape Greek concepts, or let's put it in our own day, concepts culled from Western philosophers, then sometimes it's necessary to use that language in order to bring them to Torah. To, to Torah. And that's the only way one can understand the use which the Rambam made in the Moran of Uchem of concepts taken from his culture. But in principle, the approach adopted by Rav Hirsch was similar to the one adopted by the Rambam, as is also shown. He called his main first word, Igrot Safon, as a parallel to Igrot Teman of the Rambam. The discussion took place between <laughs> Naftali and Binyamin, Naftali Ayala Shlucha, that's Hirsch, and uh, Binyamin is the brother of Yosef. Yosef uh, is probably like Yosef in Achen, who was a disciple who was confused to whom the Rambam was addressing himself and the guide for the perplexed. Now, the concept which Rav Hirsch develops, Torah and Jarech Eretz, is that the Torah has to be used as the guide in all areas of life, and thereby it brings all these areas of life as being part of Torah. And Hirsch admits that Derev Eretz keeps changing, which means to a certain extent every aspect of Derev Eretz, the content, the extent of Derev Eretz is Eo Ipso Hora Acha. Perhaps the Torah and Derev Eretz itself is not a question of being temporary, but the manner and the application of Derev Eretz changes in every place and every time. In our time, for example, Derev Eretz, as Rabbi Yitzchak Breuer writes so beautifully, has to be extended to Derev Eretz Israel. That all the questions which arise in Eretz Israel have to be solved through Torah and through Torah alone. The questions of economics, the scientific challenges of today, they're different to the challenges that existed a hundred years ago in his time. Because today we live in a completely different era. Today we live in the post-Holocaust era, when the Jewish people as a whole recognize that, like the rest of the world, that Western culture is bankrupt, does not solve problems of ethics, on the contrary, it has to some extent created ethical problems, in creating such a culture as the culmination of the German Reich, the result of German culture. So there's no wonder that the non-Jewish philosophical thinking world also realized that Western civilization is bankrupt. But we're in our time going to elevate Western civilization to give us any form of guidance. The concept of truth, beauty, and goodness of Western civilization that was still dominant a hundred years ago today are realized to be completely irrelevant. But today there are different challenges that have to be faced. And in the same manner, if we're going to follow through the teaching of Rapiesh in the right manner, we have to apply the eternal principles of the Torah to the problems that arise. Scientific, national. 
Now, I think one of the most important teachings of Rakesh, in which he differed from the Rambam, perhaps not understanding so much what was the Rambam's intention, because the Mishnah Torah of the Rambam follows this, is that Judaism must be self begreifend in the Judentum, which means if we really want to understand Judaism, we have to, above all, study Judaism in its own light. I think this is something which speaks particularly to our generation, where people who want to find out truth, they want to know the truth about Judaism, we don't want to understand a camouflage Judaism, an apologetic Judaism. We want to know what does Judaism have to offer us as young people in this modern, confused world. And therefore, this is an age when we require, more than ever, Judaism understood in its own terms. And I think this is the great contribution of Rabbi Hirsch. Not so much the fact that he, to some extent, elevated and gave a place to culture in his school curriculum, where, by the way, in the Choref school curriculum, he doesn't mention Gomorrah. I mean, so times have said, but he did that on purpose. In his time, there was a need for it. It was a Horat Sha'ar, which has not been followed. He didn't follow it later in practice. So there are changes. Today, the young people want to know Judaism completely, without compromise. That's all part of one system. The major concept of Rabbi Hirsch is total dedication to Hashem. The service of one God means the unification of all life, every aspect of it, in the service of Hashem through the Torah which He has given us. And this is something which pervades all His writings, this total approach. And it fits very well to the concept which is growing in the world today, that is to understand man, we mustn't fragmentize him. One of the problems of the technocracy in which we live is that man is being fragmentized into different pieces. As Ospensky says, we have today sciences, but we don't have a science. We don't have a science of man. We don't have a total approach to under the understanding of man and to what man's program in life should be as an individual, as a nation, his body and his soul. And it's only in the Torah that we find this total approach to man. Why? Because the Torah is the pattern of the man given by God who's created the body and the soul, the individual, the community, the Jewish people and the nations of the world. And I think this is the major teaching which can inspire young people today who are confused. And that is the reason why the writings of Rabbi Hirsch have such an enormous impact upon people today who come into contact with his teaching, the concept of the total man. And now, let us come to the question of nationalism. It is often claimed that Hirsch did not really have an understanding of the Jewish nation. What could be more relevant to the position of the Jewish nation today than his comment on today's parsha? I will take you unto me for a nation. These two short words by which here for the first time the whole future destiny of Israel is expressed, lies the specific difference, the speciality of Judaism, in which it is so absolutely unique. People thoughtlessly choose to include what they so unfittingly call the Jewish religion in the category of religions generally, as being also a kind of religion. And then afterwards they are surprised to find so much within the purviews of this religion which lies quite outside the sphere of ordinary religion. Real on to God to be a people, this itself already tells us that Judaism founded by God is a no wiser religion. I mean, today I generally say, also a question using language, because we live in the age of science. Judaism is a science and not a religion. But he goes further, he says, God has only temples, churches, priesthoods, congregations in religion. Nations, people, have relations to presidents, prime ministers, leaders, but here God founds not a church, but a nation. A whole national life is to form itself on him. As a nation, not merely as a religion, is Israel his. So therefore, from here should we gain real understanding of what Israel should become in our time. The nation of God. But at the same time, I think that through the teaching of Rabbi Hirsch, we can make an approach not only to the right-wing nationalists, but also to the left-wing humanists. Because in Hirsch, there is the crux of the teaching of the Torah that the same God who believes in the separateness of the Jewish nation, he believes in this separateness on account of the salvation of all mankind. 
The people of Israel are there. For example, the Rabbi Hirsch explains in his concept, Tchelet and Laban, the way we have to have the two types of colors in the Sitzit, which, by the way, is the blue and white, the source of the national symbol. So he says that the white represents the general, the humanistic, and the Tchelet, the sky blue, represents the specifically Jewish task. That's, of course, the symbolism of colors. And he says the interchange of the two is in order to teach us that a specific holy mission of the people of Israel demonstrated by the Tuchelet, by the sky blue, is there in order to solve problems for all mankind. And the concept of social righteousness and equality which must rule the whole of the human race, that has to be the leadership role of the people of Israel in the state of Israel when it's governed by Hashem, by the Torah. So, there is also a special relevant message for Rabbi Hirsch in what was referred to by Rabbi Broya in his understanding of Hebrew because he regarded the unity of God's teaching to the people of Israel to express itself in everything. The moral summons of God to the people of Israel to be holy nations expressed in all the mitzvot. Is expressed in every part of the Torah. It's also expressed in every word of Hebrew. And especially today, in Yerushalayim, in Israel, where we come to learn Hebrew, to become part of the Hebrew people, there is an enormous relevance to what Hirsch calls in his essays the Jewish world outlook upon life based upon the Hebrew language. In those essays, are most inspiring, and in our yeshiva I have given a course, not only on those essays, which we've also paraphrased now into English and into Hebrew, but also I've started that dictionary that you referred to, from all the writings of Rabbi Hirsch. And I feel that many people who find it sometimes a bit difficult to learn Hebrew will find enormous aid to the study of Hebrew if they begin to analyze the roots, which of course has its source in many other philologists in Jewish tradition, but were developed by Rabbi Hirsch in a unique manner, and in a manner which deserves further development and adoption. So to summarize, I feel that in the following aspects, not only, by the way, there has been a new translation of the Chumash recently by Rabbi Oren, not only in the writings of Rabbi Hirsch, have we found in recent times increasing translations and adaptions which constantly affect, and here I can speak from experience, intelligent young people when it wants to give them books and literature to read which will inspire them to Judaism. It is of enormous value to give them the writings of Rabbi Hirsch. There's been a lot of discussion concerning his educational program for the traditional sections of Jewry, but I've seen the enormous impact of his writings for those who have been reared in the Reform and in the Conservative and the Gnostic sections of Jewry. And today, we need to reclaim them, and they're ready to come back. And they need to meet with personalities and with writings which will appeal to them, which they will understand. So we need to adapt his teachings. And especially we find his teachings to be unique in a power of arousing the next generation to a loyalty to Judaism in that they are inspiring, that they present an authentic message of Judaism understood, not in any camouflaged manner, not in an apologetic manner, but from itself, that according to the way in which he interprets the Torah, it is a message which answers all problems, which gives inspiration in all areas of life, and especially that develops the concept of harmony and totality in the life of mankind, and especially that it has a message for the nationalist and humanist dilemma which faces the people of Israel today, as well as the concept of language. So I would like to perhaps just give one example of the concept of language. Rabbi Hirsch said that it says by the creation of man that God brought the creations to man so that he would see what to call them for himself. 
Everything which man as a living person names for himself, that is its name. In these names he expresses the impression which he forms of things, and thereby he indicates their sham, hence the word shem, their place in this world, ranks them in the appropriate kind, species, and things, from the root sham, which means to assess. All our knowledge of things is such a name giving. This knowledge is only subjective. It's how a man calls things for himself. The true nature of things, no human eye sees. But nevertheless, belief in God who created men and things forms an essential, essential foundation to our theoretical knowledge, because God says that is its name. Without this belief, theoretical scientific knowledge cannot escape hopeless skepticism, has no guarantee they're not deducing a dream for a dream, and proving a dream by a dream. Now those who've been reared in present-day analytical philosophy, in the meaning of language, will be able to find in this concept that language expresses the meaning and the essence of things, and that today we live in an age of relativity, and that is why we have such philosophical movements as logical positivism which say that uh, really the only reality which exists is that which is known through sense perception and through the logical faculty of man. And then there are others who become nihilists because they say, well, the logical faculty, as well as the sense perception man, is also only a relative concept, has been developed through all sorts of relative uh, evolutionary processes, and therefore is no guarantee of truth. It is through the Torah that we can build up a correct philosophy of life based upon the relatives of man, but related to the absoluteness of God expressed by the ineffable name of God, which we don't pronounce because it represents basic existence which is beyond the ken of man. And here also I'll just say this brief word of Rabbi Hirsch in his introduction to his essays, that the Hebrew word for existence is hoya, which phonetically is related to the root hoga, according to the phonetic relationship between the gichak uh, uh, consonants. So, hoga means to think, and hoya means to exist. So he says like this, that the Torah's concept of true existence is based not upon cogito ergo sum, which is the Descartes, the Cartesian concept, which is the basis of modern philosophy and thought, that because man thinks, because man doubts, that proves that he exists, and therefore what man sees also exists, but rather cogito ergo sum. That means everything which exists is a product of thought. Human beings also have this creative power to create things as a result of thinking. But where did it come from? Where does the whole of existence stem from? It stems from divine thought. And uh, of course today that's already a scientific fact that the whole of energy comes from an invisible mind. And the whole of energy is also the basis of the whole of matter. So all existence is really a product of thought, cogito ergo sum. This is just one brief illustration, perhaps a very fundamental one philosophically, of the depth of Rabbi Hirsch's teaching. Perhaps it would require a lecture or two at Yeshiva Zvayim Shalayim for people here to appreciate the depths of these few comments. So I will say that the teachings of Rabbi Hirsch have inspired not three generations, the title of, uh, of Dying Grothfeld's book, but by now I would say five generations. And that we are sure will continue to inspire even more in the renewal of Judaism. And I would like to suggest a number of practical things that should be undertaken. One is that the Chorev needs to be adapted to become, that being translated, needs to be adapted. There's no book one can give today to a person on the guidance of Jewish practice which will not put him off in Judaism unless he has somebody else to introduce him to it first. But the Chorev is the right style, needs to be adapted. The commentary on the Chumash also, although it was recently adapted by Rabbi Ores, also needs to be adapted, I think, the most beautiful manner in which it was adapted was Shemesh Marpe by Rishim and Shwab. In other words, one has to take the content and put it into present-day language rather than cling it to the language of Rabbi Hirsch, although that's also great value to have it translated as a classic. And there are very many important essays that still require translation, and through this we hope that the contribution which Rabbi Hirsch has already made to the revival of Judaism today will bring about what he writes. 
in a prophetic manner, or based upon the prophecy of the Torah, where it says, will come to pass when all these things which I have placed before you will have come over you, the blessing of the curse, and we've all experienced the curse, unfortunately, in an all too literal fashion, which Hirsch did not yet experience. And the blessing we experience is some of it, but not enough. Then you will call them to mind amongst all the nations whither God has banished you. And you will return completely unto God, your God, and obey his voice. According to all that I command you this day, Sir Rabbi Hirsch says, Only after all that has been said in this book of the Torah thousands of years beforehand concerning the state of blessing and curse which will form your future will have actually occurred. Then will you bring back to your mind the sum of the thousands of years of experience of your external fate and think about it. And the result will be, you will come back with your whole heart and soul to your God and his Torah. You will win your children to equal faithfulness to him and his Torah. For your experience of these thousands of years will finally have convinced you forever of your God and the divine origin of your Torah. The Chol HaGoyim amongst all the nations where the God has scattered you, really it said, Hiti Chacha, which means where he's pushed you out of Judaism. So in spite of all changes, you'll still come back. You'll come back with the Torah in your hands, like we find today the Russians. And a few weeks ago, someone asked me to help him to translate all his writings into Russian, to the new Russian Olim. And there's nothing better for them. And that will bring all the Russians back to Yiddishkeit. And the same applies if we go ahead with spreading his other writings. He says, together with the fulfillment of your faith brings about your ultimate conversion, uplift, and return forever to God and his Torah. Amen. One moment, please. Only one more. One more moment. Thank you, Rabbi um, Hovis, for your erudite, inspiring message. And we, were, we are very thankful tonight for having listened to two very worthy and eminent interpreters of the legacy of Rafael. But don't you think that this is the end of it tonight? I hope tonight it will be an ongoing process. We intend in the Bar in the coming year, not only with regard to the collective uh, writings of Hirsch, which have unfortunately not been mentioned, and also the few things Rabbi Hobbit has just indicated. We hope to go on and to have Rabbi Hirsch Center, Machon Rav Hirsch, in the Bar Yerushalayim. We hope that all of you will stand by and help us. That Maybe his great message will be a penalty for any truth-seeking, truth-seeking, thinking young Jewish person.